Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, Truth Seekers, and Truth Crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership Detroit-based percussionist Larry Frantangelo who for more than 40 years has added his brand of rhythm and sounds to funk, soul, and rock recordings by a legion of well-known artists. Of particular note is his decades-long collaboration with P-Funk from the late 1970s to recent years, appearing on albums by Parliament, Funkadelic, Bootsy's Rubber Band, Parlette, Brides of Funkenstein, Horny Horns, Felipe Wynn, Tack Heads, Red Hot Chili Peppers, George Clinton, and Bernie Worrell. Among the other stars, Frontangelo has worked with and recorded with are Albert King, Bobby Walmack, Aretha Franklin, One Way, The Dramatics, Was Not Was, RJ's Latest Arrival, David Ruffin, Shotgun, Dennis Coffey, Anita Baker, and Kid Rock. Wow, very impressive. Larry, thank you for joining the show. How are you? Doing well. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, it's pretty good. You got your facts there for me, too. <laughs> All right. I, I try to do my best to, to do it justice, you know? Very good. So you look very comfortable there. Uh, tell the folks where you're coming to us from today. Well, wh where I'm at is a, a new studio that we are uh, actually developing that's going to be a, it's more of a playground to do uh, streaming. Uh, uh, my partner has a vision for something like uh, uh, Daryl's house. Uh, we'll have guest artists and things, but also uh, we want to do things uh, going to schools. I also have Drum Devils, which is uh, my percussion ensemble, which is going to turn into a nonprofit for just such things. I've been a vision I've had for a long time. But this place is, uh, we're sort of in here now. He's gutting it all uh, in uh, April. We're about to go on tour with uh, Bob or Kid Rock. So it's timing is everything we're getting out when we're going to do that. They got everything, and he's got a vision of a French farmhouse and whatever. He's got and have a small chef's kitchen up here. Um, it's going to be a full bar, uh, the eighteen by twenty four stage, a recording room, uh, I should say, a control room, got our lofts, and then he's still doing uh, 
investing in stuff. So he has a little, uh, we have an office up there also, which is probably going to double if we need it for some. So right now we, uh, my old studio went away. They turned that into uh, artists' uh, housing, low income. It was actually the original Lincoln plant. So it's a little dusty and dirty. So this is quite a change. It's nice and clean. Everything's cleaned up. And this is just some of this stuff for drum devils coming by. Like going to Gold's Gym type thing. Wow, I like the I like the vision. Uh, I look forward to seeing when it's all done. Um, it could be about another year. Where where is it in relation to you know Detroit? Geographically, this, where are you? This is a, a right in Birmingham. Okay. So it would be up, uh, going up Woodward from Detroit, about, um, about 15 miles up Woodward. And Woodward is where they have the Woodward cruise and you know, all that stuff. So it's, uh, it's D Detroit's design, like a spoke, whether you know it or not, like uh, Washington, D.C. So we have grass going out east, and Woodward sort of heads out uh, northwest. So northwest in Detroit, pretty much. Great. Well, again, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. been a fan for so long and I want to get some of that inside info on some of the artists you've worked with and your experience, you know, in percussion and uh, Larry, why percussion? You know, what, what drew you to it in the first place? Well, I'm, I'm pretty much a drum nut. Um, the drum sets my original, or I should say, yes, my first, my first instrument is your voice, your second is start, but the uh, first percussion instruments I started playing in, um, I played a drum set for quite a while, while while I was developing hand drumming because I was always in intrigued about having the medium of the stick, about all the sounds you can get with just your hands or your fingers and the relationship of the skin on skin. And I'm, of course, very intrigued by frame drums. And frame drums are any uh, drums that are essentially where the depth of the drum is less than the diameter of the head. So tars and uh, uh, dolls and uh, um, it, it, it seems like every culture has a, a frame drum uh, because it's really just a skin stretched over a frame. That's probably how a drum first someone was going by while the skin was drying and hit it and said, hey, that sounds pretty good. So um, the Rick is another uh, Pandado, small frame rooms in Brazil, Rick of being Middle Eastern. But like people would look at them and think maybe they're tambourines, but they have all these different techniques and fingers. And then a uh, hand drum, starting with the mother instrument, I like to say, you know, Congo. That's where it all got started. Once you can, then moving to bongos and things where you start using more mallets um, with your fingers. So there's a lot you can get done and it's uh, it's really a one-on-one -on -one thing without, as I say, that uh, medium of the stick transferring what you're doing. The stick's a tool, this has its uses, but this is uh, definitely, uh, I miss it when I don't, when I would play drum set, because uh, I would, uh, let's play with the fusion. I came off the road with Funkadelic, I, Got with a fusion dam here in Detroit because I wanted to go back to playing kit and uh, do, they were doing original tunes and it was fusion. So it was, you know, pretty much like the game work. Kind of so um, I played a drum set with uh, Switch sometimes with Stephanie, with Bob, Kit Rock. And, uh, I used Tyrone and I used to switch with P Funk in our solos. In fact, sometimes, as you know, with P Funk, tunes would go on for a little bit length of time. So Tyrone might say, get over here, I gotta go do some business. So I would just slide in, continue on, he'd go, and uh, George would turn around sometimes, okay, T, break it down. And he'd feed some you back there. With, while he's still up there, Tyrone would come back. <laughs> okay, Fred, break. So he wouldn't even know, we could just, we could switch, it would be pretty seamless. Um, God bless Tyrone. I, uh, I miss him. He was my drumming partner. And, uh, you know, uh, I love to teach. I, I'm a student of the art. I'm a student of uh, 
uh, also uh, of the performance and uh, when the magic moments happen. So if I can drift off the story about Tyrone and I, we used to do a solo, take, you know, in solos we could take 20 minutes if we wanted. We would switch and then go back and uh, finish our solo. But one night we were in Holland. We got done with our solo and stopped like we did. And it was painfully silent for seconds. Then the place just exploded. And it was like, it felt like the guys uh, in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark or something that electricity was tremendous. We couldn't figure, figure it was just like, wow, oh, that was, it was overwhelming. So I didn't think anything of it. I mean, I did, but I was like, wow, that, it seems so you know, pretty much. I mean, it, we, we, I didn't notice anything more spectacular. You can't necessarily, I guess, be in the game and, and watch it also, kind of. Uh, but I um, oh, about, I don't know, eight, nine years later, maybe, I went to uh, the Mantra Festival. We were, we tried to have a sister city thing with Mantra. I went with the band that represented Detroit, with the Joe Duca. We were in Finland, we did Puri Finland and then Mantra. When we got to Mantra, uh, Claude Knox, who was the originator of the, the Mantra Festival, he was also head of the Warner Electric Land in Europe. Um, he had a villa up at the top, and it should be like if you were George Benson, I mean, you know, the, the, the headliners, he'd invite you up to the villa and stuff. Well, I'm there, he finds out I'm there somehow, and I get in. Okay, so I go up there and Claude Nods and seen everybody, everybody, <laughs> and the people I saw there that weekend. I mean, he's, he's came up, Larry, oh my God, it's so great to meet you. That solo in Holland was the best solo, drum solo he was going on. And uh, it led me to believe, um, as Confucius said, the student must be ready for the lesson. Well, I think it's like when the moon is in the seventh house and when you never can predict or know when you and the audience are all on the same page. And apparently that night, everything just synced up and it was a, a beautiful gift, a magic moment, as you might call it, whether we knew it or not. But I tend to look at us like athletes when we're really good, when we're really bad, we're not turning the beat around, or, you know, it, as you know what I'm saying. We, we can, we can have, it, it, and when we gel, that's when it's really beautiful as an ensemble. Now, the flip side of that story where I was playing, uh, to say, uh, this is what led me to believe music's an offering. I just, it freed me to just do what I do. It freed me up, which Parliament Funkadelic helped me to do too, to uh, George pretty much would let me We'll get to that with One Nation and stuff. But um, playing with that group again, the one I went to Montreal with, funny enough, in the early days of that group, uh, uh, I was taking, well, I was taking a solo one night, and I hated the solo, yet they wanted to carry me off right on the shoulders. It was so great. Other nights, I just think this is the greatest solo in the world, the world was tumbling and so So you free yourself up and go, you know, I'm doing the best I can all the time, and it's just an offering, and uh, it's a continuous adventure. Yeah, and so. of course, Larry, uh, for viewers talking about Tyrone Lampkin, uh, the drummer, yeah, I think uh, we only said his first name, so I want to make sure everyone realizes who we're talking about, who left us far too young. Um, yes. Yeah. He, yeah. Um, he was my brother, you know, we uh, were partners. Drumming partners and yes. Him and Bert and uh, I used to hang with Bertie too. And Miss Bertie so much. She was like my older brother, older genius brother. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you more about Bertie in a, in a couple of minutes, but I, I did want to ask you before P Funk, who were some of your biggest influences in your playing? 
Now, of course, starting playing drum set in the 60s, Keith Moon, of course, uh, uh, you know, jazz drummers coming on a little, a little bit, uh, somewhat, because they were into the Rolling Stones, of course, you know, and Charlie Potts, and um, the drum, from the drummers from uh, any of the rock bands at that time. And then uh, being influenced a lot, not without, a lot without knowing it by uh, um, our wrecking crew friend. Uh, um, I don't want to say, I'm trying to think of his name, of course, I don't want to think of it. Uh, Al Blaine, who played on all the, all the you know, West Coast stuff, you know, without knowing it, but really uh, influenced quite a bit of the drumming where it went, as well as I said, Keith Moon. One of my favorites, but very eclectic, and uh, played the drum more uh, instead of just holding down just the groove, played melodic. Yeah, it was a very melodic drum. Um, but then as I went on, like I say, I was uh, intrigued um, by rhythm. So, of course, Bassano was in the, the Sergio Mendes, you know, starting with the the, what is it, Brazil 66, and things like that, uh, where you were seeing um, the uh, Brazilian and the Afro Cuban influence coming into things. I mean, going with Franciano Rosso and Dizzy Gillespie, but that was starting to come in, you know, they have its effect in pop music um, rhythmically. The Bo Diddley's, the song, Clave, dun, 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 dun. so. So much of um, um, all that stuff started intriguing me rhythmically. So, drumming wise, as it went on, Ginger Baker, and of course, John Robin, one of my all time favorites. But um, at the same time, as I was getting out of high school and going to college, I mean, I was Elvin Jones, Art Blakey, you know, Max Roach, Jack Easy, and that, Tony Williams. These are the guys, and this is the kind of stuff that playing jazz. Um, when I graduated from, before I graduated from college, my last year I was playing the jazz trio, organ trio, 60 year old bass player, 40 year old keyboard player, like a Jimmy Smith guy. And I was a 20 year old drummer that was coming from rock and starting to incorporate congas and different things like that. Red Hole, for instance, with the Ramsey Little Street, was a guy, if you listen, little triangles and bells and finger symbols and things. So. Those things caught my ear. And then the Brazilian, like I said, the Sergio Mendes and people like Paulinho, before him, then they had and all that. Ayrton then coming in, where you saw the real melting pot of percussion. So, so many instruments from um, found instruments as well, as well as Middle Eastern and African, uh, Indian instruments from uh, the native tribes to uh, as I said, found instruments and what have you. So it, to me, it was a real um, toy box. So, uh, and really just to be able to, I say, take one instrument and get so many sounds rather than a drum set with a lot of, and the drum set was really imitating, of course, the African, Middle Eastern ensembles and things. American girls, as I call them. We invented them, uh, but they're a, uh, an assimilation of other cultures. Um, you know, Tumba, your basic. Uh, uh, Do you remember uh, the first live show you saw where the drummer or percussionist just kind of blew your mind? You don't need this, um, but it was a decent. Uh, one of my friends, my parents, did, were they were pretty strict, didn't want me out much, but his father was president of the school board, so they figured it was all right for the day room. But he took us, his, he got us tickets, his dad, he was a vice president of Midland and East Center, so he took it, well, uh, and president of the school board. In that time. So yeah, I, Olympia, when the Beatles were here, I remember that was 16. Eight, six, six, but it's been 66, because it would have been, I think, first year of high school. 
And uh, the first, we were laughing about that the other day when I first started in the studios in the late set, mid 70s, late 70s. Um, you know, people call you, or, you know, that's how I got, uh, was in Reefa's band for 10 years. They called me and asked me to, uh, uh, they were really playing Kobo, I think it was, or something. This is the 84, 86. And um, then when I played with them, they asked me to join the band. So the first um, gig that I got the call for, believe it or not, was Barry White and Love Unlimited. Was your first time in studio with Albert King? Is That's what I saw on your discography. Yes. I um, ended up, uh, Don Davis sort of was the guy after Motown which, at United Sound. So um, I got called for a session, which it turned into a couple of months out of there. Uh, I think in the one session I might have played on the Johnny Taylor or Bobby Womack and Albert King or all in that within a couple of weeks as Don added me to the rhythm section. So uh, that's right. He played in both the David Ruffin solo records, uh, Felipe Wynn solo records, and Spinners. Uh, uh, and this is why I met Bernie, because Bernie, you wanted to talk about Bernie Morrell. This is why I met Bernie on a session for Don Davis. And Bernie heard me and said, I got to tell George about it. So I came in. He called me for a session. It was One Nation, but really stripped down. I mean, it hadn't been developed. It had some basic, it was rough, roughed out, and um, I had it before percussion modules. This was a Tuesday. And uh, they're going uh, they're going crazy in the control room, loving it when I'm done. And, uh, you know, I don't know George from Bootsy. Remember, I'm still like a jazz old, and I, I probably knew like, uh, more drummers in uh, obscure <laughs> group players, uh, uh, even though I like the funk and stuff, but I, uh, like I said, I just hadn't really made the acquaintance of them. They were just, this is when they really, it was the end of the mothership tour, and they were in the studio, so it's a Tuesday, and I'm going, wow, you guys, you know, like, you, got, you guys only have a percussionist with you guys. Uh, George goes, you want to leave Thursday? And my the engineer's like, so worked out a deal. I didn't know who they were. I didn't know what helping they actually were. He saw it. You know, talk to them. So I get to the airport. I have instruments. We get to it's Providence, Rhode Island. We get to Providence, Rhode Island. George has a limo. I uh, gets a car for me. I put my instruments in trunk, hanging up the back, whatever. I get. We get to the venue. It's the Providence, Rhode Island, uh, Civic Center, like 20,000 people over there. It's the mothership tour. And, uh, you know, the difference between Parliament and Funkadelic tours. Parliament tours are where spaceships and cars and other costumes, while Funkadelic tour is when we get to play. And basically, it's Funkadelic backs up Parliament. And then when Funkadelic goes out, Parliament becomes like our back singers, you know, it becomes. More that's the band stuff. Well, this wasn't that, and I didn't we see down know these guys are. So they make room on me before we left, just to the left stage left of the drummer, which to this day I still play from. Um, and the show starts, and I don't know one song. I don't know what the heck's going on. The uh, uh, cars are pillows or whatever. And, Spaceship lands. <laughs> so talk about um, trial by fire, getting thrown into the pit. So this is like 19, 1977? I think this is 70, late 77 or 78. I think. Uh, it was right at the end of the Mothership tour. So I mean, uh, yeah, the Mothership flashlight, I'm sorry. It was the end of the flashlight tour. And uh, I don't know, George, I don't know why George couldn't have waited at the end. There's only a few more gigs. That's how George is. I was young and didn't matter to me. It's, let's do it. I get to play and do whatever I want. <laughs> so that's how that worked out. Um, so you did a little studio stuff first, then you went to that show? 
Yeah, I did this. The, the, I, I put all the parts down on One Nation on Tuesday and left on the road Thursday. So, what, um, what were your early impressions of? Uh, I mean, let's finish up with Bernie, uh, who you seem really fond of. What were your, your impressions uh, of him and and George and some of the other, you know, well known people like Gary or Bootsy? Um, you know, I, uh, I it, it you know it, it took a while to just figure out who everybody was because there's quite a few and uh, not having only known Bernie and then Tyrone and I hit it off and then it pretty much it was it was good Bernie. Um, Bernie, that was, uh, he was one that he didn't put up with, with uh, people bullshitting or, you know, being uh, from not very real. So first off, uh, you know, a couple times I went, oh, Bernie, you know, I thought he was a, he just uh, maybe ornery or something. I didn't see that side of it, but then I would start seeing why. But uh, if he loved you, he loved you. He, he, he definitely call you out, you know. But he, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was funny, definitely lovable, the best smile and laugh, and it's a deep thinker, a very deep thinker. I mean, that's, you know, he wrote a symphony one of the But, uh, yeah, and he, uh, he liked things to be fair and just and there was a with defunct that wasn't always the case. Things, other other uh, factors and things, things being as fair and just as they could. We might that's about that. But yeah, Bernie was great. Um, you know, a, a real personality and a real uh, a musical. Just uh, presence. You know. It's great. Miss Love Brother. So that's uh, that was my getting in into the uh, <laughs> and then everything really took off then because one Fidelic had their goal and you know, did platinum to a one nation. So I was really only there because the money got funny about eighty one. I was really only there from seventy eight to eighty one, but um I don't know how many, a dozen records at least in that time. And then <laughs> stuff over the years I've come in and do things or, or there was tracks I played. And uh, at one point we had uh, like t three studios around town go up. And I remember one time we were, you know, we'd be in the studios, but people showing up late or not using the time that efficiently. One time we were in town and I was flying. Uh, you had to record and then fly out like at seven o'clock or something to get you know, six thirty to get to the show at nine and nine or something. But then fly back the next day and try to finish this record on time. So we get crazy like that. In fact, um, I don't know if you know or as you know, I have a solo piece on, on one of the records called Red Timo's Bounds. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about it. He, well. That was, I came into the studio, uh, we were supposed to do something or, uh, and it was this, no one was there yet. So I said, throw up some tape, I want to do this thing, because I had. Uh, Bertino's Bounce is basically in two sections. Symphonic pieces are usually in three sections. I figured I'd do this rubato section of sound and stuff, and go into this group section, George would tack it on to the front of a tune, maybe, uh, Put his thing, his vocal, uh, uh, I should say, uh, uh, rap vocal thing over the top of it, actually, to lead into it. Well, that apparently wasn't the case, because they just kept it as it was and put it on the record. And even the funniest part is I have a solo percussion piece on the Warner 45 B side. I had my son in uh, the suburbs of Detroit next to the Hot 45 wall, and he was just about probably about two then standing with Bretino's because they should have been shot right? but they didn't know that they were... who's who's Bretino? Bretino is my oldest son. Well that's his name. Okay. Yeah, Bretino Fratangelo. Um 
So I went in that day, I went in and I did the, the piece in about six hours. Laid it down. Uh, it was a conversation, as you know, between uh, the Kuika, which is on one nation and what have you. That's the friction drum. That sounds like a little animal. So the conversation between that and Bongos, which developed into Kuika and then Chimbali, that's the two. We did like some backwards bong thing going home and going into the piece. And, uh, but pretty much it was laid down on one take because uh, I, I hit and I knew what I wanted to do. And if you can't play with yourself. <laughs> so that's, that's how that came about. And it that's just. And so everyone knows that's on electric, electric spanking of war babies from 1981 Funkadelic. So that's how that came about. And uh, then, uh, then you have all the, you know, Don was at the time too. So there's a lot, there was different things going on in town as well as me playing with different uh, jazz groups and uh, just doing other sessions. I got, were you also playing percussion on um, Knee Deep? Yes, that's where you have the Kuika. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very prominent on that track. I mean, that really helped set that unique flavor alive on that. Did you come up with that yourself? Because I know Junie was instrumental in sort of arranging that tune. And did you work with him at all on it? They, no one ever told me anything. I went in and just, they let me do whatever I wanted, which that up. Uh, because they said, we don't know what the hell you're doing for it. Like the stuff I would pull out. Um, so Kuiko was one that really got them. And then uh, talking drums, different things. Uh, I would, you know, uh, sometimes I would say that um, I am a musician that happens to play drums and percussion. So I tend to hear all of this as a large path that someone might on a fretboard or uh, a keyboard. Um, these all have different tones. They also have, uh, I should say, pitches. They all have different tonal aspects, be they wood. Uh, it's be a timbre, be a wood or metal. Um, and then uh, rhythmically, for instance, if uh, I'm in a song with, uh, where there's keyboards and guitar and everything in the mid, there's a lot of mid range stuff. Like, you wouldn't get a conga necessarily because it's more in the mid range. I'd probably add like a bongo part that would accomplish some of the same rhythm but sit in its own space. Things like that. And sometimes if it's a dairy, sometimes I want to be a woody sound. Sometimes I want it to be a little more brash, metallic, or maybe tin bottles would come in as opposed rhythmically. Sometimes basically the, uh, the same, many times basically the same rhythmic structure, but done by putting them on a different instrument. They'll sound totally different to the ear in the tin bottles that I picked up and the tin bottles. So, you know, these are, these are the things that I, uh, I consider when I um, go into sessions. But once I got, you know, after One Nation, you know how uh, after you do some things and pretty much like people will let you do what you do. And then if they have suggestions, I'm all, I, uh, many times, I mean, I, I do talk to them before because I can take the tune in a lot of directions by being the last one on the people. And I've done that. I'm like, wow, you just changed that whole tune. Well, it's, you know, it can be done. And are we taking it more in the pop direction? Are we going to get a little, you know, uh, I'm going to take a little scale with it or bring this out, you know? And then having a, a palette of instruments, which also, uh, and I'd like to thank Carl, uh, Carl Wood Small for hooking us up, a quick shout out. But uh, uh, these different uh, instruments and textures, uh, once you get your palette and start hearing, sort of where they go or where you think, you know, you think they would, would go. Um, the Bobby Wallman, yeah, funny, we, we're, we're talking about this stuff is, he wanted me to play Kuika, um, and I do this every time because the Kuika is rubbing a, a stick, I don't know if everybody knows, may I? Sure. Um, this is one of the ones we have around here, but basically a stick, Attempt to uh, make different sizes. You can use a wet rag, and then, um, which I don't have one here, but you wet the rag, which uh, will do fixed lessons. 
I do have something here to wet it with. And then basically you change the pitch of the head. You don't beat this drum. This is what you hear in One Nation. And you... So you pull the shape in different, different either uh, less would give you lower tones. If you don't pull it, pull it tightly, and make the head small. So now let's see where were we? Where was was knee was knee, was knee deep uh, looped at all, or did you keep that up for 15, 20 minutes on that really long track? Uh, no, we, back then in the days, oh my God, we were twenty four tracking. They're not, you know, you you keep that going. They weren't looping this stuff. Yeah, so fifteen <laughs> minutes, you're like keeping that going. Eight, eight. I would, I play on some tunes for 10, 12 minutes. My core is still good, I think, from those days playing double shakers. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in fact, um, as I say, back in those days, uh, it was about punching, not, and non, not non-destructive punching. So sometimes the engineers would actually have me do some delicate punches, too, as a professionalist if they wanted to. But we just want to get that. But if you miss, you have to go farther back. You know, engineers, Sometimes we'd we just want this little part, they'd mess it up. Pretty soon I'd be like two bars back, reconstructing and you know, still hoping, hoping they're going to nail it. And try, you try to give them spaces where they can nail it, you know, rather than having them doing 16th and 32nd of the punches. You try to get them where they can punch. And so, um, well, I remember the first time I saw editing in the, the, the mid 70s or I came where I think mid 70s. I came in and um, he, uh, the engineer had tape running on the floor. And it was a two, two, uh, half inch tape, which is two track stereo. Because remember, we're coming from 24 inch tape. Then they mix it down to stereo. But the way they edited it in those days is you, you didn't want that chorus or wanted to move it. You had to run that chorus up. You'd see Ra razor blades, yeah. Yep, flip the tape over, cut it with a razor blade, tape it. Or they would have, like, you'd see chorus and be hanging with a bunch of tape on the floor, a verse. And that's how the only way they could, uh, you know, because they, they would make the two track and then a safety also, and then mess with the, the editing of that one. And of course, they used to make their, their uh, cuts on back beats. Because back beats a lot of white noise. Back beats a lot of snare drum. Noise. Actually, if you heard a pop, it was just part of the snare drum. Back beat, if it wasn't quite right. But, yeah. Yeah. That was, I mean, that was a definite skill back then, for sure. Played straight through, or you had to rely on the engineer. And I'd rather play straight through sometimes than rely on like this punch. I'd rather, what, you know, it was what, really performance back then. Yeah. When, when you'd go into that studio, uh, typically what shape were those p-funk tracks in i mean how much had already been laid down who did you maybe play with in the studio most of the time many of the times i was in there by myself uh adding because uh, i would do overdubs or sometimes like i said with one nation it was almost started some of the the, the bed tracks because between the, the timbales and the Kalika, there was a little bit of bubbling going on but um you would have various stages, and then sometimes I might even add something later on, you know. But um, many times overdubs, because uh, we did a lot of it at United Sound, and we loved recording me in that big room. Uh, the big, uh, you know, they can put an orchestra in there and percussion. That's what's beautiful about this place, is you can hear it's got really tall ceilings and stuff. That's what you want. The drums sound like you're playing in a cathedral or a beach hall. So that big room, um, you know, that's so many times overdubs. And um, that gave me a, a, a case, I, I would, that would be my day to do things. So I would bring, I would have all my stuff out there. And it used to be funny because if they knew I was doing a session, the control room would get real crowded because people would want to see, okay, what's he going to pull out now? Or what, you know, it was sort of a, I was going to say something to come in and see, okay, what's going to happen. Like so, a mad scientist, yeah. Exactly. And, you know, I was free to try things. Um, in, uh, you know, that... Um, now, if I can do another step, um, 
some of this may not have come about as well as it as it did. Thank you, Lord, and thank you, Ernie Rogers. Now, Ernie Rogers, rest his soul too, was the uh, ended up being the principal of Northwestern High School here in Detroit, but was the music director for um, years. But his father, before that, had started a like an after-hours place called the Rap House. It was the Rogers Association for the Performing Arts, mostly for young Afro-American players to learn the standards. Ernie was a big guy and even had a hook because uh, you would line up and play um, old jazz standard, little sunflower song for my father. And everybody would get like two choruses, or if you would go, well, he might let you have, you know, three. But if you kept going, he, he would be like, he had yeah, a hook, he like, just like he thought of the thing. But Ernie really was a, uh, uh, and this would happen on Saturday nights, was the, the night after we, I was playing in my pop band, in my six night a week pop band. Uh, and this was before Funkadella, as I say, right mid set, about 75, 76. Um, would go there and Ernie would let me line up with the horn players except I'd be playing a talking drum or a kawika or some crazy other instrument and playing to the form of the songs trying to make these instruments play the melody of these songs. So Ernie God bless him gave me the confidence, the opportunity and uh the experience playing with other musicians to use these instruments in very melodic and um, uh, I, uh, very exploratory way. So that's the pre that's the real precedent, I believe, for them probably Funkadelic and giving me the confidence to explore those instruments and do some of those things. So when you would go into the studio and if you're by yourself, how was it communicated to you? you know, what tracks you should work on while you're there or what type of part to lay down? So many of the times I would just heard the tracks for the first time when I came in. They weren't really passing out tapes or anything. There was no internet or anything. And people were, didn't want their stuff out there either. So I would come in and be booked for the session, listen to the track a couple of times. It's like a multiple choice test, supposedly. The first answer is the right one, right? So you, I would just, you know, and then I would ask, like, okay, well, where are we going? Sometimes, where are we going with this? And you were writing this. Let me get into that a little, and I'll bring some of that to it by what I use or what I play. So, but many times, um, you know, the musical, I call her my mistress. She'll tell me, I just relax and listen. And then I see there's different ways I can take it. So I would communicate then with the artist, or the producer, more often than not, um, about what the vision of where, you know, uh, 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 the tune, or uh, if they said, you know, uh, put something on here like this, sometimes I'd say, well, the hi-hat's doing this, I could be doubling that, how about if I try this? And they'd hear, okay, or no, do that, then I would do that, uh, if they wanted that doubling of it. I had part any of shaker or something. I felt was sort of redundant, but if they wanted that. And uh, uh, basically, I was there. I believed I could play it. Uh, well, Bobby Womack, from back to that story. He had me play a cooking part with him and Candy Staten on a ballad. They're singing this beautiful ballad, and I'm like, I feel like I'm a back there. Like, what the hell am I doing? But he loved it. I, I mean, he reinforced or, or made me the first re realization. You can play any tune, any song on any tune. It's how you play it. What you're bringing out of that instrument that fits the music. I mean, there's better choices. There's a limit to good taste and none to bad. <laughs> but I mean, it's all in taste. Uh, 10th grade socialists try to teach each other. Can't argue taste. So it's all, like I said, an offering for me. I put it out there. And you know, let them decide. You know. how, how often, if ever, I mean, was George Clinton around the studio when you were there, or you know? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, um, so he was a clubhouse. 
It was like a clubhouse, you know? And even if I wasn't doing the session, you'd drop by, hey, hang out, you know? Hang out, dude, see the cat. I mean, because it's, you know, it's your band. <laughs> so come by. And I mean, no, I saw, saw George a lot. I mean, so. What 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 you what do you think his uh, great talent was? How was he able to be the ringmaster of that whole thing? You think? I believe it was much like uh, what Frank Zampa did. He, Frank Zappa, if you were great, whatever you were great drummer, he said, "Well, what do you do better though than anybody? What else do you do better than anybody else?" He didn't care if you could touch your tongue or your nose. He didn't care if you could juggle. And I, that's what like George, he just. Uh, he let you do, he gave you the freedom to do what you wanted and appreciated your talents and try, you know, saw what he could do with them. He, he didn't judge them or really point you. Vocally is where they did most of their pointing in direction to where they, you know, nail stuff. But the music, and then, you know, the music too, but not it. I um, said, my. My part, I just had a lot of a lot of freedom to to do what I felt was best for the two. That you know, that's that was a great um, gift to have received to be able to do what I responsibility. But um, I don't know. I, I enjoyed it. It, it. it kept me thinking all the time. You know, because I wasn't following. I'd be following a chart. I wasn't chords. And, okay, what am I going to do? I, was, I could be a, a, a part of the rhythm. I might be the texture. I can just be colors. We like water. Like this. This is what it was. We like vapor. Liquid. I was a rock. Did, did you often not know like what project things were going to go on? You were just like laying stuff on tracks, and it might go on Parliament, it might go on Parlet, it might go on Funkadelic. You didn't. Know. You come in and, like you say, they play the tunes for me. My record is 14 in a day, uh, two different sessions. Uh, but I, you, yeah, you come in and just put down what you think. And then, you know, and like I say, sometimes they'd be like, okay, we need lunch and come back in. I think we need that. Then I'd come back in and do that. I did a lot of sweetening and punctuation. Uh, they would bring me in sometimes to, like, okay, what does this track need? They'd ask, like, what can you do to? To do do something, I think. Well, what are we trying to do? And we talk it out, and then I try to try to give them it, and it was successful much of the time. Which you know, uh, it worked. How, how, how do you um, sort of orchestrate or coordinate what you would do um, in an analog situation with actual instruments? versus what they were bringing electronically at that time, like electronic hand claps and things like that, that they were interjecting into, you know, Parliament and some of the P-Funk. So was that something that was new for you at the time to figure out how to augment electronics with what you do? When the electronic thing came around in drum machines, I still work because they wanted me to put the humans there. I, I was the Greeks where my rhythms have been for percussion, and you could get away with that more. Uh, one of the reasons that I moved away from playing drum set was at that time, and more into percussion, because drummers were being turned into drum machines. They were expected to play like a drum machine only too. It just isn't for me. I like to be able to have a little bit of freedom in what I play, the instruments I play, you know, and that's where this all worked out well. It was like, it's, I, and I played over many tunes that were drum machines that, I said, that I greased up and might not even know. You know so um, when we went to the digital, there's a problem too. When we went to digital a recording from the analog, you know, when you're recording uh, 24 tracks, uh, 24 tracks, you also record 24 tracks and noise. So just in the old records, it's like a white noise or an ambience. To it. It'll just be there, be at the room, you know, where you're recording a uh, tape noise. There's just a uh, machine noise that gets on tape. That's where the Dolby noise reduction noise. 
So we went to, we started recording on digital, I think the first day. And then George was like, damn, that's, that, that just sounds too, that shit sounds too clean. So I'm like, oh. So we went in with the snare drum and just started doing random, not even in rhythm, you know how a 45 pop, that pop would come around and it didn't even be in rhythm type thing. When you were playing on a phonograph, there might be a piece of dust and they'd be like, boom, and it wouldn't be in rhythm. So I just went out there randomly for the track of dirt brushes, just so he had a bad set. He wanted to hear that. I knew what he was talking about because it was like suddenly we were in like this hospital room with fluorescent lights. That's what the tune sounds you know. Digital can be just uh, sterile. Yeah. Oh. So that's where what are some of the funny stories. How, how many tours did you end up doing with them? Well, like I say, till eight through eighty one. So uh, from seventy eight to eighty one. So, like three major tours, or yeah, probably three because every year we went out 78, let's see, 79, 80, yeah, like three. Uh, but it was, uh, I mean, I'm doing pretty much the same thing with Bob uh, these days, he, uh, and it had been in the last years. Uh, you do the big arenas, which would be parliament tours in the uh, beginning of the year, January to about March, April. Then you go outside to the funk festival festivals and all that then in the fall we would do theaters which would be the funkadelic tour we do like, like 900 seat theaters there'd be people lined up for five blocks when they found out because we just played 20,000 seats city earlier in the year or something and that band loved to play that was the other thing you really uh, you played you said we played like for 10 minutes you know we would I think our record was over four hours for the show. Four and a half is really crazy. You know. There must be one or two shows in particular with P Funk that just stand out in your mind for whatever reason. What okay. what might what might one or two of those shows be, Larry and why? The, the first one I played when I first played Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to show New York what I got for some of my machine. Well, all the trucks went to Providence, Rhode Island or something. So it's a Saturday night in Madison Square Garden. It's a parliament tour, tour. It's also number of spaceships, cars. <laughs> Nothing there. They rent Tyrone a little. This is Saturday night. And this isn't the days of our studio instrument anymore. We're talking 1978 and whatever. You, sh sh shit's gone in New York. You can't get stuff on a Saturday night. And there was no big company. Ty we got Tyrone a little Beatles drum set. You know, it's like this without this floor down. I've got like two really terrible congas. And so we're going to press. We do, we're do. we doing the show anyway. The parliament and say, none of the other stuff. And that's what we, that's what we did. So I'm telling the crew, go find me. Give me some. Turn, get those trash cans, turn them over, 55 gallon drums. Now I had some volleys, right? Go fill, find some, go bang on shit and see what makes noise. They're bringing these signs, crash on. And they're filling bottles with nails and shit. That's it. So that's one of the most memorable where I think they were still bringing me stuff when the show was over. They were just, just look what I did, did the audience seem to notice anything? Was a foot? What's that? Did the audience seem to notice anything was a foot? They didn't mind because, I mean, the, that's the whole thing about P-Funk. I mean, it was like the groove was just, we grooved. It didn't matter. I mean, it was just that shit. We grooved. It didn't matter. It just didn't matter. And once those grooves, I mean, it was like you were in it. You didn't care about spaceships or anything at that point. You know, you didn't care if it was a parliament or a funkadelic tour. They knew that we did both. I should and I don't know. And I don't even know at that time if the Funkadelic tours would go over. And that sort of came in as I was there because uh, One Nation it was the first big one for, for Funkadelic. So, um, but didn't seem to be a problem. Um, I mean, I, I, I didn't really hear any repercussions. 
So logistics, trucks going to the wrong place, pretty important. Was it a kick for you to hear songs on the radio at the time that you were playing on? I mean, how did that feel? Really, really wonderful, especially One Nation, because I was all over that, you know. And to hear that, yeah, that was like, yeah. yeah. I would hear other things, because I, I was doing a lot of sessions at Katrina Don Davis, and, and other people would call me, you know, say RJ, uh, at uh, John Lewis's studio. He had a place called Sound Suite. So we did a lot of was not was stuff. Um, Pearl Sound was coming up. Uh, the disc, so I did Bertino's Bounce, um, but uh, doing other things there too. A uh, Studio A, because I was playing like the uh, Ted Nugent record, uh, um, uh, Mitch Ryder, uh, you know, a lot of the other Detroit stuff that wasn't related. I mean, I was doing R&B and gospel records. I'm on Grammy and Gold, uh, Thomas Whitfield. Uh, uh, even Anita Baker, before she became an Anita Baker, was in a group called Commissioned. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's even before Chapter 8. It's, uh, yep. Or Chapter 8, I mean. Then there was a, that's right. There was the other group, Commissioned, was another gospel group. So I was in doing that, as well as rock, a little rock and roll, um, some jazz and uh, fusion stuff, um, as well as the funk and <laughs> R&B, because uh, I... You know, I, there wasn't a lot of people, of course, that did what I did. Uh, that could, they had all those sound. And this is, otherwise, it was all synthesizer uh, at that point. Um, and I, I tend to look at what I do, at, like the, there's the drummer and then the percussionist, much like the piano player and the keyboard player, because he can be a synth, you know, he, he can be a synth player. Uh, he has a lot of sounds in his disposal. Did you have any studio time where Bootsy was around? Yes, I played on a couple of Bootsy records. I think a Bootsy a rubber band, and then I went out to Bootsy's studio in Cincinnati a few years back. We did some things. Yeah. What oh. I was playing is we have all these guitar players in a D funk, and you know, there's so many of them. On one of the tunes, I put a guitar intro with a wave drum. A wave drum is like a, the holy grail of electronic percussions. It's, it's a synth, it's a modeling synth, so you can do all this crazy stuff. I, I use it as a drum for a certain sound, but mostly for other textural sounds. Or I said I got a Hendrix patch and put the guitar in it. <laughs> I'm one of Bootsy's things. So it's just crazy. All the things. Was he a, a, a character? Was his a talent impressive in the studio? Uh, what'd you take away from him? Yeah, yeah. Bootsy but, but, you know, knows, what, knows what he wants and what he's doing. You know, like he, he has a plan. You know that. So, uh, he, yeah. I, uh, and him again, he pretty much lets, was like, do, do your thing. So that's good. Uh, I enjoyed that. And then, uh, you know, I did some stuff with Eric Leeds from Princess. Uh, uh, they flew me out to Basin Park to do. Uh, the first record was uh, Eric Leeds was a prince, and Sheila and myself doing separately. But uh, that, that was very nice when I was out there. Uh, it was 94, I think. Uh, Kim Bassing over there. I was like, who's that? She was hanging out. How, how'd you make the connection with them through George? They called me, yeah, yeah, through George, because uh, we did the Atlantic Graffiti, Tuna Graffiti Bridge, too. So George produced some. That's the, the Chili Peppers connection too, and then that's a funny story too. Because Chad was is like one of my. If you look at Mother's Milk, it, was, it has my name with Dad after, because he's like one of my. I call him one of my eldest illegitimate sons. So he, we were do the band they put together here when I got off the road with P-Funk, a lot of money behind it. Chad ended up being the drummer. And so I was working with him and we did this solo and all these things that, so he was like somewhat of a protege. He went to LA and then got the Chili Peppers gig, but Flea and Anthony, I said, I had already met from doing Freaky Style. So it's sort of a funny thing, you know, that I'd already met that. I had told, I told Chad about this band that I went and recorded with, which was funny when we were playing in Detroit. That ended up a few years later going out and getting 
There's a lot of small ones. Yeah, so um, Freaky Sally was it Jack Irons or who played drums on that one? Yes, yes. Yeah. And then again, here I come in over to we would have just like say tomorrow. Uh, the, most of the rhythm section I stuff I did was with Don Davis uh, because we would, uh, you know, they would that would be the thing back in the seventies, coming in and book for a three hour session and go through a couple tunes, you know, keyboards, bass, drums, um, guitar, and then be added percussion because you know I. I uh, I'll influence what's going on sometimes too, uh, it being part of the rhythm section that we get. So that's how I ended up just being part of the rhythm section. So three days a week, show up on the studio work, you know, as well as whatever else. But through down, you know, to at least two, three days. And there was there's overlap with Carl Butch Small, who's been on the show, and um, how. Did it suss out, you know, if you or Carl would play on a particular P-Funk track? It was sort of like the who was available also, because, uh, you know, I was still doing out and doing things, you know. Um, we started with Aretha in, like, 86 till about 96, I think. Or, so somewhere in there, so I'd be, if I was out of town, you know, they want stuff done now. So that would... Uh, or vice versa, you know. There, they said we were, there wasn't too many of us doing it. <laughs> and there was a lot of people that I guess wanted. Because, uh, yeah, if you look on our discogs and all the stuff in the air, there's quite a bit, there's a couple hundred records around there. Just that whole hour. Well, if for, for people listening to the records, is there a way to sort of distinguish you from Carl? You know, do you think there's a certain stylistic tendency? I, if you listen, if you listen, you would. You would. We do play differently. That's for sure. You know, I just have different, I think, influences and um, just our instrumentation. I think our batteries are probably a little different in, in some respects. Um, I tend, I like, I incorporate some Middle Eastern stuff too. Um, not enough. <laughs> and uh, just, I think, just the, the different influences of where we, what we came through. And then, uh, I don't know if Butch is a drum set player per se, or if that's his start. I don't think so. I don't think he no, plays for drums. So. I have that. that. The drummers like to play with me a lot because I know where they're doing their fills in different things. I tend to play around, either start their fills off or when they're done. In other words, they're usually playing on the threes and the fours. A lot of my stuff will be on the ones and the twos, and uh, maybe one beat, two beat, and that's it. You know, not a lot of, it's more spice on my end, you know, layers of the groove. And, but, um, like I say, I'm still a, a, a student of the drum set too. I love playing kid. I miss it when I play percussion. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.